First Timothy chapter three. Just going to read verses one through seven. First Timothy chapter three. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for this day. I thank you for the word that you've given. I thank you, Lord, that we can use it to uh, correct ourselves, Lord. We can use it to put the mirror before us and understand who we are and make changes. I thank you, God, that you've given the word to us, that for now, Lord, we can preach it, teach it freely. I thank you for your many blessings upon us, for Christ's precious blood shed on the cross for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> what we have here, everyone knows as the qualifications of a pastor, the qualifications of a bishop. Now, what I'm going to do with uh, the next few uh, support sermons is uh, just walk through these one by one. I'm taking a little bit of a different approach to it because as I studied these things, I, I noticed, um, yeah, they're very good qualities indeed for a bishop. I believe they are, as the Bible says, a bishop then must be, and then it lists all of these qualities, qualifications, what have you. But what I want to bring to our attention is, Christians, don't shirk your responsibility. Don't, don't avoid, don't evade. And don't hide from these qualifications as if there's something set apart for a specific type of person, for a specific man, for specifically your leadership. Because as we walk through these, I think you'll find that each qualification for the bishop, or each must be for the bishop, is in fact very specifically in the Bible set forth as a qualification, a quality for all Christians. So what I'm entitling this little series is, A Christian Then must be. A Christian then must be. A Christian then must be blameless. Now, the term blameless, um, I've often heard it said uh, by, by those who have taught this passage um, um, in many different avenues, I've heard that no accusation should stick. Blameless means that no accusation should stick. But I don't necessarily think that's what the Bible teaches. I think the Bible teaches more of the idea of being without fault, being innocent, being guiltless, especially in specific circumstances, specific contexts. Look with me to Genesis chapter 43. Genesis chapter 43, if you will. In Genesis 43, beginning in verse 7, I'm going to try to go through this pretty quickly, so keep up if you can. If not, listen well. Genesis 43, and in verse 7, the Bible says, And they said, the man asked us straightly of our state and of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Had ye another brother? And we told him according to the tenor of these words. Could we certainly know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said unto Israel his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou, and also our little ones. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee, and set him before thee, let me bear the blame forever. So here is Judah offering to his dad a surety. He says, hey, if I don't bring your son back, then it will be my fault. You will hold me accountable for going hither and returning thither with the child. And if not, you may put the blame, you may put... The fault you may take away my innocence, the guilt will be upon me. Genesis chapter 44 is a similar idea. Genesis chapter 44, 44 and verse 10. And he said, Now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. So the blame would be removed from the person who said, Hey, I, I have no, no account of this. I do not know. And only once 
the item was found in this context, only once the item was found would he then be innocent, would he then be guiltless. Hey, because he said he wasn't involved in this situation, therefore he can be blameless of that particular situation, that particular circumstance, if indeed his story comes out correctly. Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12 in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 12, and in verse 5, Matthew 12, 5. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say to you, unto you that in this place is a greater than the temple. But if he had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Here blameless is being associated with guiltless. Christ here is the guiltless one. He's being accused of breaking the Sabbath. And the reality is, even as the as the uh, the context shows, the temple, the priests in the temple profaned the Sabbath. How did they do that? Well, they performed circumcisions. They performed certain duties upon the Sabbath day in order that they could keep the law. And because they were so um, obsessed with the minors, obsessed with the minute details of the law, and not know so much the spirit of the law, being obsessed with the jots and the tittles and the here a little and there a little, they, they, they removed from themselves the spirit of the law. And what they did was essentially, they made themselves to be innocent in that situation. They made themselves to be blameless. And I believe here Christ is affirming that. Yes, you did your priestly duty by circumcising the child on that certain day. Then why are you accusing me of working on the Sabbath day and suddenly I'm to be blamed for it? He's making this direct comparison. You will not blame your priest for circumcising on the eighth day. Uh, for the child and the Sabbath day for the rest of the world, but you're now blaming me because I go about doing good, because I go about healing, because I go about doing whatever good works I do on the Sabbath day. Now you're saying that I'm guiltless. Now you're saying that I am to be blamed. That's wrong, and Christ is clearly teaching that. It is reasonable here that the Sabbath was broke. Christ healing people on the Sabbath day, it was reasonable that the Sabbath was broke, but it all comes down to what your definition of broken, or your definition of profaning that Sabbath day or that ordinance is. Here we find the priest, here we find even Christ, they're blamed and yet they're guiltless in this situation. They've done right. Christ has done right. We know that he went about doing good at all times. Luke chapter 1 and verse 6. Luke chapter 1 and verse 6. I think we all know this this story, and we'll get to know it a little bit more. In Luke chapter 1, and verse 6, we have the story of Zacharias and Elizabeth. It says here, And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. So here the Bible is clear that they are walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But we know that the scripture says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So what's happening here? Is this a conflict? Of, is this a contrast? Is, it, is the Bible contradicting itself by saying that they, they are walking in all the commandments and all the ordinance and they're doing it blamelessly? Or is there something more here that we're missing in understanding? Their blamelessness is, yes, indeed, walking in the commandments and in the ordinances. But the way that they do it, I believe blamelessly and in all of them is the same way you and I do it by the imputed righteousness of Christ because no one can say that they're walking in all the commandments and all the ordinances without fault without error without sin without being accused of without being blamed for breaking some law and having that that just fall be lifted from them hey we're not any of us short are um, free of being blamed being accused of breaking these commandments and having them actually stick upon us. And I believe that Zechariah and Elizabeth are in the same manner. How did they walk in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord blameless? Because they had the imputed righteousness of the Christ upon them. How did they have that? By looking forward to the cross, by believing God, by the same way that Abraham did, receiving the righteousness which is by faith. And they became heirs of the promise and they became within the family of faithful Abraham. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 1. This is clear though. It is clear that we are commanded to be blameless. Don't, don't think that I'm letting you shirk from this responsibility. This is my whole point of this, is to, 
make it aware, make it very clear that, hey, Christians, a Christian must be all of these qualifications of the bishop, all these qualifications of the pastor. It is actually their responsibility. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4 According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And yes, he ha having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. So our blamelessness here again is being associated with the predestination of Christ in that those who are faithful, those who are saints, will be because of Christ blameless because he has predestinated them unto that because they have believed and that is the vehicle by which their destiny is sealed when they enter into that though when this was written they weren't necessarily there yet they enter into that predestination by faith through Christ because the predestination is the faith of Christ and the vehicle by which somebody becomes blameless they are made accepted in the beloved they are made that holy without blame and they're made it by in love philippians chapter 2 philippians chapter 2 a few pages over philippians chapter 2 and in verse 13 for it is god which worketh in you and that's important there it is god which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure so where's the will come from well it's worked in you by god Where's the doing of his good pleasure? Well, it's worked in you by God. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. In verse 15, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So you are blameless because of the will of God which worketh in you. God worketh in you the will and the doing. And because he does that, you may be blameless and harmless, as the sons of God without rebuke. We all know that we use John quite often to prove that somebody is a son of God. When we prove that they're a son of God, we use that to say, hey, you are in the blood. Hey, you are the son of God forever. Nothing will change that relationship. And in that same context here, we find that because you're the son of God without rebuke, because of your, you're the son of God and you will not be rebuked and have that blame fall upon you and now you're guilty, it doesn't mean that. What it's saying is, hey, you are blameless, you are harmless, and even though in this world and in this flesh, you may have blame stick on you. And that can happen to me each and every day. My boss just found something this week that he blamed me for and it stuck. Yeah, I messed up. I had to own that. Does that now mean that I am not blameless before Christ? No, there's a completely different av uh, avenue, there's a completely different arena there, whereby my blamelessness before Christ is completely different than my blamelessness in this world. And this is one thing that I've noticed is that all of these qualifications for the bishop, all of these a Christian then must be, a bishop then must be, have both an outward manifestation, which you and I see each and every time we look upon somebody, or which we look upon ourselves in the mirror, they have that outward manifestation, but they also have a spiritual realization, the fulfillment of the qualification, the fulfillment of the quality of the Christian, of the bishop, happens spiritually, and that's the part that we don't see. That's the part that only God sees. <clears throat> Peter was not blameless. Go to Galatians chapter 2. Shocking. Peter, one of the first bishops, one of the first great apostles, Galatians chapter 2. He was not blameless. Shocking. Was he disqualified? Was he now allowed to be a pastor? No, we know that he'd served many years after this. But look in Galatians chapter 2, in verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that, certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew himself, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So, he was blamed and it stuck, right? He was accused of, of, of essentially withdrawing from the Gentiles because he feared the circumcision, because he feared man. Therefore, if we were to look at him, we would say, hey, he is, he is not blameless. But we know that Peter went on pastoring, preaching, leading. He was, he was a great leader. He was one of the first to just rise up and preach. And as far as we know, when you read uh, First and Second Peter, he continued to do so until the day of his death, leading and teaching. And, 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 but we go, we go here and we're like, he was blamed by the Apostle Paul. Therefore, he's not blameless. 
Now, that's where you see here, there's the outward manifestation of what it means to be blameless, which all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is also the spiritual realization of that. Now, he was blameless before Christ. He was, without, he was without spot. He was without rebuke before Christ in love because he was accepting the beloved, believed on Jesus Christ. Again, I'm not trying to shirk from your responsibility. I'm just trying to show you that there is both... Um, an outward manifestation and a spiritual realization of each and every one of these truths, but I'm also trying to push it back on you because a lot of people walk around with great big beams in their eyes and they want to say, oh, such and such, so and so, this and that is not X, Y, and Z. And they want to put some sort of tag on someone of what they're not supposed to be. And I'm just trying to shove it back in your face, Christian. Hey, get that beam out of your eye before you rebuke somebody for not being blameless. Hey, you better check yourself because you are required by God to be blameless as well. How do you do that? Well, you're saved by the blood of Christ. And then you act out what that salvation works in you. It is God that both worketh in you and to do of his good pleasure. That's your responsibility. When you believe on Christ, you are blameless before him. When you act that out, you are blameless before men. That's your responsibility, Christian. Don't look at somebody and then just start throwing mud. Don't look at somebody and just start accusing. Again, I'm not lowering the bar. I'm just making us realize that there is a standard to be followed. In fact, I'm raising the bar here, and I'm saying that whether or not I desire the office of a bishop, I am required as a Christian to be blameless. That's the command of God. It's clear. Don't shirk from that responsibility, any of you. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.18. 1 Corinthians 1.18. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians 1.18... 1 Corinthians 1, 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you, become, you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You think there's going to be some people standing there on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ that have some blame on them, that have some fault on them, that have some sin in their life, that have something where they've done wrong? Maybe in the great catastrophe, someone who is recently saved just lets out an expletive just because that's all they've ever known. They were born again five minutes ago. The reality is, yeah, there's probably going to be some people that are blamed by men that day, and that blame would apply. They would be wrong, just as Peter was wrong for moving away from the Gentiles. They would be blamed, and it would be true. But God here is saying that God is faithful, and he will confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless. That's a promise of God. So no matter where you're standing in that situation, why would that be the case? No matter what you have done in that particular day of the Lord, why are you blameless? Why can you take that promise and apply it to yourself? Because it's God that does it. He shall confirm you. He shall do the work. He worketh in you both to will and to do. 1 Thessalonians, a, a connecting verse to this. In 1 Thessalonians 5, it talks about this same event. 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 5, it says, Ye are all the children of light and of the day, and the children of the day, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. Look down in verse 23. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and whole soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never hurts to say a prayer like that, but I believe that that promise is, is just as sure. And as he reaches out to the Thessalonian church, he says, Hey, I pray that you are spirit, soul, and body preserved blameless. Well, we know the soul is preserved blameless. We know the spirit is alive and quickened in Christ because the children of the light and the children of the day are those that are born again, those that are saved by Christ. But here the Apostle Paul is praying that even their body would be preserved blameless. How is their body preserved blameless? By crucifying the flesh by being in the spirit and not in the flesh unto that day, unto the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe, as it says in verse 24, faithful is he that calleth you, here it is, who also will do it. The doing again of that blamelessness, the doing of the preserving of the soul and of the spirit and of the body 
is the one that's faithful, the one that called you. It's Jesus Christ. The next point, a Christian then must be the husband of one wife. A Christian then must be the husband of one wife. Immediately all the ladies are going, huh? <clears throat> Obviously this is clearly not for ladies, okay? A Christian then must be the husband of one wife. But turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to talk a little bit about the men here, but also try to connect the fact that indirectly, as a body here, this also applies to us. A Christian then must be the husband of one wife. It must be the, the, uh, the, the wife of one husband, the, the spouse, the one singular um, relationship happening here. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So we see here the proper order, and it's to avoid fornication. So right there, we know that even though they're talking about, about um, men directly, um, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. He says, let every man have his own wife and every woman have her own husband. So he brings it back to that by connecting at the point of fornication. Fornication is avoided by having your own wife, men, and by having your own husband, woman. That proper order is given that there should be one spouse. But specifically, we are talking about, in, in regard to the qualifications of the pastor, we're talking about men. Every man. Now, first of all, people are going to say, well, what about the Apostle Paul? Did he not meet those a Christian then must be? Did he not fall into that category? I believe Paul here is one of those cases where the exception proves the rule. Um, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 7, I would that all men were even as myself. But, he says, every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, another after that manner. The verse right before it, he says, but I speak this by permission and not of commandment. I believe Paul was just being um, humble here. I believe that these fall into the category of commandment, though Paul may be not necessarily understanding that at the time. But he says here, he would that all were as himself. And he's talking about being single. He's talking about being um, alone and simply married to the cause of Christ, married to the ministry. He said, I would that all were even as myself. But this manner and this specific proper gift is exactly that. It is not for everybody. Look at verse 9, the Bible says, But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. It's very clear that you're, you're treading a very thin and dangerous line when you say, Hey, I'm just going to stay single, because what is being brought up here is, it is better to marry than to burn. It's not just it is better to marry than to, than to and, then, and then some stuff slip off, mess up, oh no, whoopsies. No, it, 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 it almost brings hellfire into the com conversation, though I don't believe... That's exactly what it is. I think that burn is pointing back to burning in their own lust. It's pointing back to burning in the flesh, burning over the fornication, that desire that comes up in somebody. That's why I don't believe this is for everybody. I believe that 99.9% .9 of people cannot contain. And it is better for them, then, to marry. In verse 17, he says, if you look in verse 17... But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all the churches. So it is God actually that appropriates what somebody walks in. Hey, some people are going to be saved being single and already divorced. Hey, perhaps I believe the Bible teaches that, that you ought to stay in that state. Some people are saved and they're married, and though their wife is, is an unbeliever, or their husband is an unbeliever, maybe they come down a lot of flack off of The Bible says, if they depart, let them depart. But I don't believe it then gives license to remarry. The Bible says all sorts of different ways to quantify and to qualify and to, to, to maneuver in these very complicated human interactions. And I believe, though, as the Bible says, as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one of them, so let him walk. Even as you read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I believe you see the Apostle Paul kind of going back and forth and trying. He says, I don't speak this, I speak this by permission. And, and you quite often see the Apostle Paul just get right in there. And, and he, is, he is black and white. He doesn't give every, any wiggle room at all. But now you have him talking about, you know, if it's a virgin, this is good. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. But... Um, 
but nevertheless to avoid fornication. And I'm not saying he's being wishy-washy, but I'm saying that this is a very complicated topic. But I believe that the ideal, I believe that the perfect scenario, I believe that God's intended purpose dates all the way back to the Garden of Eden is brought up again in Genesis chapter 2, as we know, in Ephesians chapter 5, in Matthew chapter 19, in Mark, is brought up here again in 1 Corinthians that the best situation is that there would be two and they shall be one flesh. A man and a woman, they shall be one flesh, except in very rare circumstances. So then, a Christian must be the husband of one wife, or, or, or should they be? Well, I see in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, if you want to go there, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 1, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And here's the bigger picture of the church of God. Here's the bigger pi picture that involves ye being the church, being presented as a chaste virgin to whom? To Christ. So there's the wife of one husband application that we see that just overbears, overarches all who would be a part of the church. And yes, there are different assemblies here and there and everywhere. But the picture is clear that there is to be one husband and picture is that Christ would be that husband overseeing his wife which is the church. So in very rare instances, on a personal level, in very rare instances on, on the, uh, just, just on our plane, on the outward manifestation, you would have someone who's a Christian who is not the husband of one wife or, or who is not married to one spouse, the woman who is married to one husband. But the Christian man must be blameless, the husband of one wife. I believe that that is ultimately the overarching story, the overarching tell. That unless you want to walk that fine line, unless God specifically calls you and directs you to walk the line between between burning and being married, <laughs> you gotta walk that line. You gotta you gotta you gotta not do that or walk it if you're being called to. But I would I would express the concern that hey, that is not for everybody. It's got to be God ordained. You gotta know that you're in the will of God. But it's better just to marry. And the Apostle Paul makes it clear. And countless stories in the Bible, right from Adam and Eve, say, hey, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cling to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. A Christian, and you will, if you would like to add that, a Christian man then must be the husband of one wife. <clears throat> a Christian then must be vigilant. The Bible also says sober, and I can put these two together. Vigilant simply means to be watchful, to be circumspect, to be looking around, to be attentive. Ephesians chapter 5 talks about this. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. It's being very clear that um, the idea of vigilance and, and the definition that I found within, within the Bible and, and within the context and within dictionaries, the best description I can find for vigilance is to be watchful, is to be circumspect or walk circumspectly. And that's the wise route. 1 Peter chapter 5 says, in 1 Peter chapter 5, he talks a little bit more of this. 1 Peter 5, beginning in verse 8, the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Who resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So be sober, be vigilant. These go together. The idea of walking circumspect, the idea of being watchful, that being attentive. If you're not sober, you're not going to be vigilant. If you're not vigilant, you're not going to be desirous to stay sober. Those two are hand in hand, and even here in the same context. Be sober, be vigilant, and this is your resistance to the devil. When you see him coming, when you know how he's going to work, when you know where the attack's coming from, if you're sober, if you're vigilant, you're in a position whereby you can resist. Look down at verse 10. But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. 
To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. There's another verse where it just says, God is the one that makes you perfect. God is the one that establishes you. God is the one that makes you strengthened. God is the one that settles you. He is the one that gets the glory. And he is the one that has the dominion forever and ever. Lest we should think our vigilance or our sobriety is somehow manifested in us. And yes, there is that outward manifestation. There is the truth that, hey, somebody who is studied, someone who is, is uh, attentive, someone who is just watching and being circumspect, grounded in the faith, will be vigilant. They will be sober, and they will do their best to remain that way. But the outward manifestation is only part of the spiritual realization where, hey, it is God that makes you perfect. It is God that establishes you. It is God that strengthens you. It is the Lord that sets you on a firm place. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 5. Ye are all the children of light and the children of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. So again, we're exhorted, we're encouraged to be watchful, to be sober. And because we're the children of the day, we ought to not sleep as do others. We definitely ought not to be drunken, but we need to be aware, and we need to be watchful. Well, why? Because we are called unto this salvation. That is our hope, is that salvation. So we got to walk in that. we got to be that. we gotta, we got to follow after God in sobriety. We have to follow after God with zeal. We have to follow after God with vigilance and sobriety. A Christian then must be vigilant. A Christian then must be sober. Don't remove that responsibility from you, each and every one of you. Titus chapter 2. Let's go to Titus chapter 2. <clears throat> Titus chapter 2 and verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient unto their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things. And now notice we've changed gears here. Now this is the bishop. Now this is the deacon. Now exhorting the people, because there's aged men here. There's aged women here. There's young men. There's young women. There's servants. There's even masters being talked about here. And we continue down. It says, in all things, young men, exhort to be sober-minded. In verse 7, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. So we see that change happen. We see that the bishop then must be all these things. And in Titus it says, um, the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine. It's basically a repeat of the same uh, list we read earlier. But now he is taking what he is through Christ, taking what he has learned through Christ, taking what God has worked in him to will and to do, and he's simply using that as a teaching point. He's using that to lead about the aged men. He's using that to exhort the aged women. He's learning that to build up the young men. He's using what he knows and what he is and who he is in Christ to show the young women how they ought to behave. Teaching servants to serve. Teaching masters to lead. Is there a lower standard here? Is the bishop then a set-apart man with higher requirements, expectations, qualifications? He's got to be a thir certain thing. He's got to be a certain way, look a certain part. No, he's, he's simply an example of what a Christian then must be. And that's what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, just a few pages back. 1 Timothy 
chapter 4, and verse 11 says, These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but, here it is, be thou an example of the believers. Not be thou an example to the believers. His point isn't, and his desire and his mission isn't to be the example to the believers as if what the believers see is the be all and end all. He's simply supposed to be the example, be that an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Well, how does he do that? Look at this. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Well, is it only for the pastor? Is it only for the bishop? Is it only for your spiritual leader to read the Bible? Is it only for him to exhort others? Is it only for him to know doctrine? No. His responsibility, it's the responsibility of every Christian. So I believe that this is then a Christian must be. A Christian then must be blameless. A Christian then must be husband of one wife. We saw how that plays out. A Christian then must be vigilant, must be sober, and the purpose of leadership is to be an example of all of those things that we've discussed. They're to be an example of it. It's not an example to them. They're not presenting themselves as some sort of uh, picture that they must just emulate and follow. No, it's simply a picture that they can emulate because they've seen those traits worked in the elder. They've seen those traits worked in the bishop. They've seen those traits worked in and then that trait becomes something, that qualification, that quality just simply becomes something that is emulated by the people. Yes, they teach it. Yes, they exhort it. Yes, they bring it to the people and explain it and, and, and expound upon it and prove it and show how you can and give practicals for it. But the ultimate responsibility is for each and every Christian to then must be all those qualifications of the bishop. And we'll continue on with this study further as we go.